Great to see everyone this morning. Uh, hope everybody's having a good start to their week. I asked Alan to uh, swap with me this morning because my wife is under the weather, so I'm going to have to uh, be watching the little kid that runs around and gets under everybody's feet. So he was glad to do that, and I'm appreciative of that. Just got a few announcements. Well, I've got several announcements this morning. The Gills, let's be sure to, to, to keep that family in our prayers. They constantly seem to be having some kind of issues, but uh, let's just keep them in our prayers. <clears throat> Keith Cato is Alan's uncle. He's uh, under hospice care right now. Let's be sure to pray for him as well. Uh, Sudi Hillis is a member of Center Chapel, and she or was a member of Center Chapel. Sorry about that. She passed away yesterday. Let's be sure to keep that family in our prayers. Keith Anderson's cousin Scott is uh, not doing well. We need to be sure to keep him in our prayers as well. As well as Don Zimmerman, who has attended here a time or two. Be sure to keep him in your prayers. He's uh, not doing very well at all either. Um, Maria Anderson's cousin, Gloria Judd, is in Skyline. She's had a stroke, and Maria says she's in, in very bad shape. So let's uh, keep that family in our prayers as well. A uh, friend of JD's, Bob Abbott, is uh, in very bad health and needs your prayers as well. Several people need your prayers today. Uh, Jeanette McPete is also a friend of JD's, and she's not doing very well at all as well. Let's see. Okay, Jose Suarez, who uh, attended here on Wednesday night a little bit, he was uh, uh, a good friend of Beck and Clay's. He graduated from Navy Basic. Let's, uh, good news there. Let's see. Letters to child in the bulletin. In the center of the bulletin, there's it's time to write your letters to the child and uh, the winter weathery winter weather. Bulletin is in there as well, stating what we do in the winter weather. And I think that's all. I wrote them all over top of one another, and I hope I covered everybody. Any announcements that I missed? Yes, there is one. It sure is. Blue car land right here. Uh, Miss June's son in law, Jimmy Patterson, needs prayers. He has uh, kidney cancer. Uh, we'll post this card out there. It's got his address and all on it, so let's be sure to keep him in our prayers as well. Now, anything that I missed? If not, we'll turn this over to the play. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be 
Our next song this morning will be 784 in our song book. 784. We'll sing all three verses. Why did my Savior come to earth and to be humble go? Why did he choose a lowly bird? Oh, 
Oh, 
And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us give thanks for the bread this morning. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus, the life that he lived, the sacrifice that he made, and the memorial that you established for us to reflect on the blessings that we have because of his sacrifice. We remember his body and his sacrifice as we eat this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our God and our Father, for the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary that provides the washing away of our sins, we give you thanks. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And we give you thanks and we honor and glorify your name for the sacrifice that you were willing for your son to make, the blood that you were willing to be shed on that cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our custom, even though it is the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, it is an opportune time for us to give thanks for our blessings. I was driving to the building this morning, and I was thinking, as I always do on Sunday mornings, I was thinking about my responsibilities for the day, other people's responsibilities. I was going through a mental checklist in my mind because uh, one of the things that I am most concerned about is forgetting something. I think it goes back to a traumatic experience in my youth. My father was presiding at the Lord's table, and the people who were responsible for preparing the communion uh, only prepared one set of communion trays. And so there was a set that was in the communion room at the back of the auditorium for the second worship, uh, but the first worship trays had not been prepared, and my father opens the lid. And even though he just said it very quietly under his breath, thanks to a PA system, the entire auditorium heard, it's empty. <laughs> now, fortunately, my father, who uh, uh, had a knack for these types of things, passed out the trays. They all walked to the back of the auditorium, switched those out for the ones that were filled, and the service went on. So I, I always think about things like that on my way to the office. And as my ADHD brain works, I got to thinking about how sometimes we take blessings for granted. And it's not, it's not that we intentionally take them for granted. It's not that we're not thankful for them or appreciative of it. But it, um, it just becomes commonplace. And, and that's something that we need to try and protect against, something that we try to avoid. It's not at all unusual for me if I'm making announcements or at the end of the lesson uh, when we have a guest song leader to express appreciation uh, to that individual for, uh, for coming here and, and leading singing for us. Uh, back in October, I had two of our pretty regular song leaders tell me that they were going to be unavailable uh, for the month of November and December, and I appreciate the heads up. Uh, it gave me some time to try and figure out, even though I knew I had no options, an option, right? And uh, Clay has been instrumental uh, in helping with that. 
Uh, he is responsible for Andy uh, Clark being here last week. Uh, we are going to have a new song leader on the 18th, uh, and Clay was responsible for that. And uh, Clay, of course, is leading our singing here this morning. And so, as I said, I oftentimes uh, point out and express appreciation to our uh, guest song leaders. And while I can't necessarily say that it is uh, great to have Clay with us this morning, I did want to point out uh, his work uh, behind the scenes and the fact that he uh, will do anything that I ask. I've never once had him say, uh, you know, Alan, I'd really rather not do that or anything like that. Uh, so uh, we take things for granted because they're commonplace. We see Clay here every single week, and I oftentimes will comment on the guest speak, uh, guest song leaders, uh, but I wanted to express appreciation to him uh, this, this morning. Uh, and having done that, I also wanted to remind us uh, to uh, make a concerted effort uh, for those things in our lives that we sometimes have a tendency to take for granted. Uh, as we see or have seen over the last couple years, shortages on the shelves, things that we would never even think about, uh, to uh, take time and be thankful for those and certainly uh, give God the glory for them because we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Let's thank God for our blessings. Our God and our Father, we come before you today and we are mindful of how blessed we are. And we are mindful that there may be times in our lives when we are not as grateful, not as thankful as we ought to be. There are things in our lives that we give little thought to. And yet, we acknowledge this morning those blessings in our lives. And we acknowledge that you are the author of those things. You are the giver of those blessings. We have prayed today for those who, whose health is not what they would want it to be. And are reminded of the health that we enjoy. There are those who are homeless and have no place to live. And we are mindful not only of our homes, but this house, your house, where we can gather together and worship. There are those without clean water and food to eat. And here in just a while, we are going to enjoy a Sunday lunch. And we get to decide what it is that we eat. The list could go on and on of our blessings. Forgive us when we are not as thankful as we ought to be. May your Spirit help us to be grateful as we ought to be. And may we always remember that every good and perfect gift comes from you and give you the thanks and the glory for those blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song this morning will be 220, 220, was in the first and third verse. Thank you for those uh, kind words, Alan. It has definitely been a blessing over the last, I guess, 10 years now to serve the kids that have come through the building, but also be able to serve the congregation in the ways that I am able to. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Rejoice, 
rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives. salvation to Christ is made 
lineup of individuals on every point of the spiritual spectrum. On, on one end of that spectrum, you have individuals who are fully aware of the freedom and the liberty that they have in Christ Jesus, and they enjoy living in that freedom. They enjoy living in that liberty accordingly. On the other end of the spectrum are, are those who are walking in fear of some misstep. They are walking in fear of stumbling and becoming defiled with the contamination of the world, and as a result, they live their lives accordingly. Now, if that were the end of it, there would be no problem. If, if that were the end of it, there would be no problem. However, those who realize and enjoy their liberty in Jesus are constantly being judged by those who think that they are living too loose, too liberal of a life. The other end of the spectrum, there are those who think that those who are not enjoying their liberty in Christ Jesus do not fully understand and appreciate the salvation that, that they enjoy. And so there is this constant criticism of those who have stricter standards and those who have more relaxed standards. One group gets labeled as liberals and compromisers. The other group gets labeled as legalistic and harsh. And in our text for the morning, Paul acknowledges this problem and hopefully is going to help us to find some balance in our lives. You see, there are, there are some things in life that are crystal clear. There are some things in life that are crystal clear. For example, the Bible says that we should not curse, kill, steal, lie, and, and other things as well. Uh, but the Bible is crystal clear on that. Uh, and, and beyond that, those who practice such things are sinners and are under the judgment of God. That is not my judgment. It is a clear statement from Scripture. However, there are other things in life that are not so clear. There are some things in life that are not quite as clear. Uh, for example, how long is it acceptable for men's hair to be? Uh, should women wear pants? Should Christians watch TV or go to the movies? Is it okay for men to wear beards? These are things that even today we discuss, we deal with. You know, I love ironies in life. I love ironies in life. And, and here's one of life's little ironies. When I was at Lipscomb University, men could not have facial hair. Students could not have facial hair. Now, I don't have a problem with that per se. Uh, it's called conduct regulations, and if you agree to work for your employer, or if you agree to attend a school, there are certain rules that you have to follow. I don't have a problem with that uh, in, in theory or in practice. Uh, here's where my problem came from. Uh, the problem came from in the main foyer of the main building that you would enter when you come onto David Lipscomb's campus, there is a life-size painting. A life-size painting of David Lipscomb, the university's namesake. And in this life-size painting in the main entrance on campus is David Lipscomb with his signature beard. And, and it wasn't until after I graduated from Lipscomb in 1998, last century, uh, 1998, that the uh, rules were relaxed and it was okay for students on campus to, like the university's namesake, wear beards. And, and so this is actually, some of these things are actually things that we still contend with uh, today. And today, Paul is going to give us some insight into handling these doubtful areas in our lives. At the very least, he's going to help us know how to deal with our brother and sister in Christ who may have a different opinion than our own. Our text today from Romans 14, the first 12 verses. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, 
But he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, and another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who does not eat, for the Lord does not eat and gives thanks to God. For one does not live for himself, nor one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And so in these verses, Paul wants to let us know that we are to avoid foolish judgments. Verses 1 through 4, we are to avoid foolish judgment. We are commanded to recognize our Christian brother. We are to recognize him. We are to recognize her. Now, Paul speaks of a situation that was uh, prevalent in the early church. You see, there are two groups of people in the early church. You have Gentiles who had come from a place of uh, paganistic idolatry that stood in sharp counter distinction to Christianity. And so when those Gentiles came out of that very pagan, very immoral type of lifestyle, they wanted absolutely nothing to do with it at all. Nothing whatsoever to do with it at all. And, and, and so the Gentiles tended to have a much more extreme reaction specifically meat that was sacrificed to idols, which is something Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians. Uh, here in Romans, he is not dealing with the idea of meat that is sacrificed to idols specifically, but I am of the opinion that he is addressing the same thing. Here, he just addresses it from the standpoint of one individual does eat meat, another individual does not eat meat, and, uh, or, or as we would say today, they are vegetarians. They, verse 2, eat vegetables only. Uh, I am of the opinion that it is because of this link to idolatry. And this is where we got, uh, or this came from, the Gentiles. Now, the other group that we have are the Jews. Uh, the first century Jews who came out of Judaism and into Christianity uh, had shown through the gospel that they had the liberty to eat meat. Even those meats that were sacrificed to idols. Because, again, I'm drawing heavily from Paul in 1 Corinthians. If you want to flip over there in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, Paul dealt extensively with this issue. Uh, not only meat sacrificed to idols, but how brothers and sisters are to engage and interact with one another when differences arise that are not matter of doctrine, but rather are matters of opinion. So, uh, we have both of these groups in the church at Rome. And Paul's response to that is, we are to recognize our Christian brother. Acknowledge that that individual's opinion comes from where it comes from. And the Bible does not give direction on whether or not you can or cannot eat meat. Now the focus of 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 had to do with the weaker brother, again in greater detail, but we are also dealing with that same issue here. And, and one of the things that we need to understand is that there are people all around us who are going to see things differently than we see things. We need to recognize that truth. In other words, we need to understand that we're not the only dog on the walk and... What others think about us, we need to be willing to dismiss, but we need to be careful about developing 
opinions about our brother or sister in Christ based not on the Word of God, but our personal preferences. We are to avoid foolish judgments. We do that by acknowledging, recognizing our Christian brother. Even though I am not comfortable eating meat for whatever reason, I must acknowledge that it is okay for that brother to eat me. Instead of being critical of that sister who chooses not to eat me, I must acknowledge that individual's liberty in Christ Jesus to make that decision. We are also cautioned to receive our Christian brother or sister. Some people would like to shun those believers who disagree with them on whatever the issue is. And again, remember, we are not talking about those foundational doctrinal issues. I've already addressed that in the introduction. We are not talking about foundational doctrinal issues. We are talking about where opinion, matters of opinion enter in. And Paul wants us to know that in those instances we have liberty in Christ Jesus. And the way we're going to avoid those foolish judgments is by first of all recognizing our brother or sister. And then as opposed to shunning them, accepting them. Now, why is it that we should refuse to shun a fellow brother or sister in Christ? Uh, well, the main reason is that we all have all kinds of hang-ups. The problem with the weaker brother is this. He has never yet come to terms with the liberty that he is, that he has in Christ Jesus. This individual is living a life of fear. As if God is looking over the balcony of heaven, just trying to wait on us to make some type of mistake or slip up. And as a result, unfortunately, this weaker brother actually begins to think that he is stronger than the other brother or sister and should live up to his standards. One of the things that really frustrates me about Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, this whole discussion about the weaker brother, is I have never in all of my years of ministry seen the weaker brother actually use that verse. You know what I have seen? I have seen the older, more mature spiritual brother use that verse to try to bully his way or to keep his thumb on top of someone else. I don't like this person's opinion, and so even though I am the spiritually mature, stronger brother, I'm going to play the weaker brother card. And that sometimes happens. The weaker begins to think that he is stronger because of his more strict restrictive standards in his or her life and then tries to apply those stricter standards to an, another person's life to try to dominate them or to get their way. In other words, Paul is telling us that the individual brother's restrictions in his personal life should not be allowed to be a cause for division or disunity within the church family. And so Paul says at the end of this first section that we are to be challenged to regard and respect our fellow brother. If we are not careful, we will allow our differences, and this is true in life, not just the church. If we are not careful, we will allow our differences to drive a wedge between us. If I do not think you should do a certain thing and you do it anyway, then it is very easy for me to be judgmental about that. However, Paul wants us to know that I need to be big enough in the Lord to overlook our differences for unity's sake. You see, there are some things that are worth dying for. Foundational biblical teaching would be an example of that. There are some things that are worth dying for. There are some things that are worth standing for. Uh, there are some things that I do believe that I am not willing to take a bullet for. I was eating lunch with my sister just yesterday, and I don't remember how the conversation got to this point, but she goes, would you take a bullet for me? Would you jump in front of a bullet for me? And my response to her was, 
No, I would not. If I've got time to jump in front of the bullet, you've got time to dodge the bullet. We can both live that way. Well, there are some things that I do think I would take a bullet for. There are some things that I won't. Uh, I am going to take a bullet, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper on a, a weekly basis. Uh, instrumental music in the church, uh, I have no problem with instrumental music in the church as long as it's neither seen nor heard. Make sure you heard that full sentence before you start judging me there. Uh, <laughs> There are some things that I'm not going to take a bullet for, whether or not we use praise for the Lord song books or songs of faith and praise. Uh, not going to take a bullet for that one, right? Not going to take a bullet for whether or not the Lord's Supper is first or last in, in the worship service. But there are some things that are worth standing for, and there are some things that are nothing more than mere personal opinion, and that's what Paul is talking about in our text for the day. These kinds of things must never be allowed to hinder the unity of the church. And Paul gives us two thoughts that will help us in that area. Number one, respect one another's principles. Whether a professing believer agrees with us or not isn't the issue for Paul here. Paul's issue what is whatever convictions he may hold concerning some activity. Uh, whatever that might be, is his, and he has a right to them. I may never agree with him. I may never see things his way. But I am not to despise him. I am not to have a lower opinion of him. Nor am I to judge him, making a spiritual declaration about his spiritual condition. I may not agree with him, but I am still, according to Paul, supposed to respect him. And I am also supposed to respect his position. This is verse 4. The whole idea of this verse is that none of us are God. We didn't save this brother. We don't lead this brother. This brother does not answer to us. His life, if his life is not an issue to God, then why should it be an issue to me? So regardless of what you think about another believer, what he or she thinks or does, ultimately, they are accountable to God. They are not accountable to you or to me. Now, there is a sense in which we are all accountable to one, accountable to one another, but in the matter of dealing with things that are not clearly defined by the Bible as either right or wrong, then we are accountable to no one other than our own conscience and God. Paul then moves on to talk about how we are to aspire to faithful judgment. First of all, verse 5, in the matter of convictions. Paul turns his attention to the matter of convictions here as it relates to holy days or holidays. Some people say that we shouldn't celebrate holidays. Other people say it's perfectly fine. However, Paul tells us to do whatever you want. It's a matter of conscience. If you choose to recognize a holiday, then feel free to do so. If you choose not to, that is a matter of your own conscience. In those instances, I am to base my decision based on my conscience. If I'm bothered with doing it, then I am not to do it. If I am not bothered by doing it, then it's perfectly okay with me doing it. Paul has a pretty interesting view of conscience, by the way. Uh, when we all get to heaven, assuming I make the cut, uh, there are a few things that I want to talk to Paul about, and one of them is his view of conscience. Because Paul's view of conscience basically says, if you obey your, if you disobey your conscience, you sin. However, if you obey your conscience, you still may sin. Uh, you can have a seared conscience. And so uh, I'm planning on having a conversation with Paul about conscience. But one thing that he does make clear, if you violate your conscience, even if there's nothing wrong with what it is you're doing, if you violate your conscience, you have done wrong. If I can do it and honestly say as to the Lord, then it's all right. But we are not to violate our personal convictions. He then talks about faithful judgment in the matter of consecration. This verse reinforces the idea that I just made. In every issue that arises in life, I need to ask myself questions such as, does this honor God? Uh, does this dishonor God? Can I do it with a clear conscience? And if it contains even the slightest hint of wrong or evil, 
as opposed to glorifying God, then I should probably avoid it. These are valid questions that should be used by the Christian to determine what he does or does not allow in his or her life. Paul said this to the Thessalonian church, abstain from every form of evil. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Again to the Thessalonian church, Paul said in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If the spirit of these three verses cannot be maintained in doing whatever it is that we are thinking about doing, then it should probably be avoided. And then we are to aspire to faithful judgment as it relates to the matter of consequences. Consequences, first of all, in the earthly realm. We need to understand that no man is an island unto himself. And as such, others' lives are either helped or hindered by the way that we live our lives. Other people's walk within the body of Christ is either helped or hindered by my walk within the body of Christ. And there are certain things that it would be perfectly lawful, perfectly okay for me to do, but Paul would say that if it causes a brother to stumble, I won't do it. Specifically, eat meat. And again, he said this in 1 Corinthians, not here in Romans. But he said that in 1 Corinthians. Therefore, I must refrain from doing things that are lawful for the sake of the brethren. And there are several other verses that support this notion. Jesus in Mark 9, whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he be drowned in the depths of the sea. In 1 Corinthians 10, what I just referenced, Paul said all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. What a view of life is in view here. The Christian who walks in the love of God for his fellow believer will always put others' needs ahead of his own. Do not merely look out after your own interests, Paul told the Philippian church, but also the interests of others. And so we have a view of consequence as it relates to the earthly realm, but we also have a view of consequence as it relates to the eternal realm. While the spiritual growth and life of our brother should be of vast importance to us, there is a concern that even outweighs the here, the now, the temporal. And that is to be reminded that our lives are to be pleasing to the Lord. We are His, and as such, we have no rights of our own as we live our lives, because 1 Corinthians 6, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom we have from God, and you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The overarching consideration should always be, how does this fit into the God's plan for my life? Whether we grasp it or not, whether we teach it or not, Jesus is Lord. His function as Savior cannot be divorced from His function as Lord. In the final analysis, He is the only one that we have to please in our lives. And if we live lives that honor Him, He will take care of the rest of the situation. And so Paul concludes this morning by telling us that we are to anticipate a future judgment. Here, on this side of eternity, judgment is restricted. While we walk on this earth, we need to remember that God's judgment on us is restricted. And as such, our judgment of others should not exist. It should be restricted in our lives as well. Now, if a brother is living in open, blatant sin that is violating clear biblical standards, yes, that matter should be addressed. Jesus addresses it in Matthew 18. Paul addresses it in 2 Corinthians 4. But apart from that, those instances when we have an obligation to speak, as the proverb writer said, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Other than those things, we have a responsibility to restrict judgment. And so judgment is restricted here, but judgment is rendered over there. One day that brother that we think is such a compromiser, one day that brother that we think is so judgmental, whichever end of the spectrum that we fall on, one day that individual will stand before the Lord and give an account for his or her actions. 
Then the accounts will be settled. Then it will be dealt with properly. And it will be dealt with properly by the Lord. That individual will either be blessed or suffer loss as a result of his actions, her actions, your actions, my actions on this side of eternity. 1 Corinthians 3 beginning in verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay any foundation except that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quantity of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built remains, he will receive a reward. If a man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. On that day, each will get exactly what is coming to them based on how they live their lives on this side of eternity. Just as that brother will stand before the Lord, however, you and I will stand before the Lord as well. It will be a day of perfect reckoning and accounting. Therefore, may the Lord help us to avoid judging our brothers and sisters in matters of preference, in matters of opinion. If I am going to judge a life, let it be my own life. If I am going to be a blessing to my brothers and sisters in Christ, then let us be a blessing not by setting ourselves up as judges and jury, but rather by loving them, praying for them, and living our own lives in such a manner that it would be an example to them. This morning, have you been guilty of imposing your standards on other believers? Have you been guilty of setting up in your own life a little kangaroo court from which you have rendered judgment on other individuals' lives? Oh, we've all done it from time to time. Haven't we? We've all done it from time to time. Sadly, some do it all the time. And so with this truth in our minds, it would be good to be reminded of the words of Paul in Philippians 2, verse 12. So that my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more so in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you have never worked out your own salvation, then this morning I encourage you to do that. Repent of sin, confess Jesus as the Christ, and have your sins washed away through baptism. And if as a Christian you've been guilty of judging your brothers, there's a cure for that problem, and it's called repentance. The help that you may, uh, that you need, can be found at the cross of Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply strained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me now safe. Love lifted me, me. when
Our closing song this morning will be 523 in our song books. 523. It's good to see everyone this morning. I hope you all have a great rest of your Sunday. After this, we'll have our closing prayer. I hope to see you all again Wednesday night for Bible study. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted the skies with heavenly hue and framed the world in its great might. There is a God. He is alive in Him. We